praise the Lord, everybody. If we could stand to our feet this evening. I'm grateful to be in this place with all of you. Sometimes I need the body. I don't know about you, but I need to come together with like-minded believers to get on one accord, one mind, to lift up my Heavenly Father and to just set aside the weights, the burdens, the things that plague us throughout the week and to just get focused again on my purpose, on Him. And so I just ask that as we begin to sing this song tonight, that you would just honor Him because He is great, that you would enjoy the fact that we have the ability to come together with one another and to worship Him in spirit and truth. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. You deserve the glory. 
God, do you believe that tonight? Come on, let's love the Lord. Let's praise him. Hallelujah. You're great and greatly to be praised, Jesus. You're mighty and holy and wonderful, Lord. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the name of Jesus. What a mighty and awesome, wonderful God we serve. Amen? Turn around to someone near to you and just greet them in the name of the Lord, and you may be seated. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So glad you're here tonight. Thank you for taking time to come on a Wednesday, making it important to be in the house of the Lord. Praise God. How many of you know what these are? I am told that we need about four more of this kind of size right here. So... There's 150 in one of these, 140 pieces in the other. Um, and so we need four more bags before Saturday, okay? So I believe that they're here tonight in your wallets and checkbooks. So if you could help, thank you so much. Help us out and get four more of these, all of you that have already brought. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you don't have time to buy uh, before Saturday See Sister Alicia, and uh, if you want to give her some cash, she can go and do that. So if you don't have that, you want to give online, let myself or Pastor Jack or Brother Joe know, and then we'll let her know how much it is, and we'll cut her a check or something of that nature. So one way or another, we need to get those four bags, okay? Amen? Amen. All right. Praise God. So if you're going to help, say, in Jesus' name. name. Thank you. We got more than four bags right there. That was it right there, I'm telling you. All right. Well, Mac and Maggie, you guys ready? Is anybody ready for Power Hour? Are there any kids that are excited? All right. And Stope students are in here tonight. There's no life group, so all right. Wow, we've got a good crowd in here tonight for this. Praise God, praise God. <clears throat> I'm excited about all that God is doing and um, grateful for his anointing and his spirit. What a great, great, uh, powerful move of God we experienced Sunday. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the best is just still yet to come. It's going to keep getting better and greater and deeper and more wonderful. And hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to join me in Colossians 3. Now, you may stay seated. I know typically we stand, but if you want to, it's all right. But go ahead and stay seated if you'd like tonight. Um, that's all right. Uh, they got the Holy Ghost sitting the first time. Is that all, you know? It says it filled the house where they were sitting. So 
Amen. Praise God. Doesn't mean we have to sit all the time, but anyways. Colossians chapter 3 is where I'd like to take you and express some things in regard to our uh, theme that we've been on for this month. I'm excited to tell you next month, uh, month of our, uh, November, we're going to be reviewing the theme of forgiveness throughout the Wednesdays in November. There's some exciting uh, lessons that are going to be taught, and I'm excited. Our pastoral team is working and praying, and also uh, Brother Jeremy is going to be bringing a lesson to us as well. Excited for that for the month of November. So look forward to that. All right, Colossians 3, verse 1. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, excuse me, in these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And I want to teach tonight on this thought, above all love. Amen. Above all love. And as I mentioned, we've been exploring what holiness is all about and digging into some things, and tonight we're going to continue that, and I am uh, grateful and excited to share that with you. Um, Let me also mention on behalf of our Bible quizzers that they are uh, putting together some teams. They would like to have some competition within the church. If you're interested in putting together a team, um, two or three of you want to get together and talk to Sister Karen and uh, uh, meet with her tonight or, or by Sunday, but uh, studying some chapters out of Galatians and compete against our Bible quizzers to kind of give them some help. So talk to her, see her tonight. be a great opportunity for you to learn the word. Praise God. All right, here we go. Let's, we're going to look at these verses almost in a verse-by-verse concept, but I just want to take you through some things and show you some things from these verses that we've read here tonight. First of all, in the first four verses, one through four, I really see this as a, uh, uh, an opportunity for us to seek and set. I need to seek the things of God. I need to set my mind on uh, godly and positive things. And really in verse one, if, if, if I could just kind of put that in my own uh, summary, if you've got the Holy Ghost, act like it. That's really what he's saying there. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. In other words... Live like you have the Holy Ghost. Act like you have the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, Let your life uh, be one that exemplifies Christ in all that you do. You know, it's one thing to talk in tongues on Sunday. It's another thing to speak right on Monday. You know, I've I've known people before that, you know, man, they can talk in tongues and and, and, and all of that, but they'll, they'll, they'll curse their, their neighbor or, or they'll, 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 you know, tell a dirty joke or, well, hello. Let's be cautious that that what we're doing all the time is pleasing to him. Verse 1 also, he says, seek the things that are above. You know, so many times we worry about what's going on down here. 
We're worried about everything else. But do you notice it says, seek the things above where Christ is seated. In other words, that doesn't mean he's aloof or nonchalant to what's going on in the world. Seated there is a governmental term. It means he is seated at the place of authority and power. What is going on in the world has not dethroned God. That's what it's saying there. So put your mind on those things. We get so hung up in the news and the media and the bias and all that's going on. When was the last time you got that excited about what the Bible says? Oh, I might just preach a little bit here tonight. You know, we'll take what the commentator says. We'll take what the news anchor says for law and gospel. But, you know, we'll look at the Bible. Well, I don't know. That's, you know, 6,000 years old. Hello. Wait a minute. You know? All this stuff, uh, oh, the earth is, you know, you know, anyway, I don't want to get into it. But the point is, read the Bible, because I, I can take you to the Bible and show you that the, the worlds not only were framed by his word, but are still held together by his word. And so all this garbage of, you know, the, the planets being destroyed, I don't believe it, because it's held together by his word. It will be destroyed one day, but not because we're spraying aerosol cans in the atmosphere. It'll be destroyed because he's going to breathe out fire and destroy the earth. I'm not saying we should be nonchalant and, and you know, recycle, do things like that. Let's, you know, whatever. But, but in reality, folks, get, let's get away from what's going on down here. Seek the things that are above. Okay? Stop worrying about what's going on down here. Number two, verse two, rather. Um, you're an ambassador of Christ. Set your mind on, on things that are above and not on things of the earth. You know, how many of you remember that commercial, your mind is a terrible thing to waste? Okay? Uh, it's still true. What are you putting your mind to? What are you setting your mind on? Okay? So set your mind on that. But notice, it's an action you have to take. It parallels Romans 8 uh, when it talks about, you know, the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. And you have the ability to what you're going to set your mind on. Some of you might be thinking about something else other than what I'm preaching right now. <laughs> that happens, you know. There are times I, I've seen people, you know, uh, writing out their laundry list or writing out their, uh, you know, grocery list or whatever. It's like, okay, well, good for you. Praise the Lord. You know, good luck going to Baker's tonight. Amen. You know, hopefully you'll hear something I'm saying. Amen. You know, the advent of social media, you know, we can sit there and, and, and be all around the world at one time. What are you setting your mind on? What are you thinking about? And not just in church, but what are you thinking about anytime, all the time? What are you putting your mind on? What are you setting your mind to do? Verse 3, here he's uh, saying, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What a beautiful verse this is. Okay? When you're born again, watch what happens. When you're born again, you no longer live to yourself. You no longer live are your own. Your life is not your own. You belong to Jesus Christ. And another way to look at it is your past is redeemed and covered by the blood of Jesus. It reminds me of the missionary who had gone to, I forget which African nation, but he was there. And in this particular uh, town he was in, they said, do not go into the city. Because in the city center uh, near uh, uh, where uh, a lot of things take place, there is a uh, warlock that will, that will tell you all about your past. He will, he will reveal your past to you. And, and don't go because he'll, he'll embarrass you. And the, and, the, and the missionary said, I'm not afraid. And so he went into the city to do some business, and of course, this warlock saw that he had a new uh, candidate, you know, a different person, and so he began to do his incantations, and, and he would be frustrated because nothing would come up, and he wouldn't be able to say anything. And finally, he looked at the missionary, and he goes, what is wrong with you? You don't have a past. And the missionary looked at him and said, yes, I do, but it's under the blood of Jesus, and you can't see it. Amen. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Praise God. Aren't you thankful for that? Verse 4, because of this, when Jesus comes back, you'll appear with him in glory. What we experienced on Sunday, that momentous moment of just raptured in the presence of God and feeling that, those are times that are just a little down payment of what it's going to be like for eternity in the presence of God. 
no, no time clocks to go punch the next day and, and, and nothing else to worry about but just basking in his presence. And so what he's saying here is when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I'm looking forward to that day, amen, when I hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm looking forward to that day when in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I'm changed from this mortal to immortality. I'm looking forward to that day when I hear the trumpet sound. And as Luke said, in the midst of all that's going on, Jesus said, when everything's bad, when everything is going bad, lift up your heads and look up for your redemption draws nigh. Amen. This is why you should seek the things that are above. This is why you should set your mind on the things that are above. Why? Because this world is not my home. This world will pass away and be destroyed by fire. But what I've laid up as treasure in heaven, those things will live forever. Amen. So what are you seeking? What are you setting your minds on? Well, let's transition now into another part of what this context is saying and look at this phrase, put to death. We're going to look at verses 5 through 9 now and, and see some things that we're to put to death, okay? Notice how strong of a link, put to death, kill, mortify, crucify, get these things away, kill them. You know, uh, David didn't just knock down Goliath, he cut his head off, he, he killed that. Does that make sense? So don't just knock your problem down, kill it. Amen? All right, let's break it down. Sexual immorality. This is literally the Greek word pornea, of which, of course, we derive the English terms pornography or pornographic. It also means to sell off or the selling off or surrendering of sexual purity, promiscuity of any and every type or marital unfaithfulness. And so, therefore, it includes all forms of sexual sin. So sexual immorality, put it to death. Number two, impurity. This means the impurity of lustful and luxurious, recklessly extravagant and wasteful living. Put it away. Put it to death. Get rid of it. Passion. Now, we talk a lot about the word passion in the English, and what we mean, or at least what I mean when I say that is, you know, you need to be passionate about what you do for the kingdom. You need to be passionate about what you do in your marriage, and, and that's what we mean. But the word here means this. Strong feelings or emotions which are not guided by God. In other words, if I'm more passionate about my sports, my career, my education, anything else than God, if I put my wife and family above God, I should Love them, yes. I should provide for them, absolutely. But God has to come first and foremost in my life. So passion, okay? By the way, when a person's feelings or emotions are given preeminence over truth, they're committing the sin of passion. You heard people say, well, I don't feel like the Bible says that. Well, since when did your feelings negate what the Bible says? Let me also state this. Since we're talking about holiness, why do you need a personal conviction for an absolute command? If, if Jesus said it, do it. There is no argument. You know, we say, well, God said it, I believe it, that settled it. Honey, if God said it, whether you believe it or not, it's settled. All right, let's go to number four, evil desire. Now, the word desire alone would be good, but when you combine evil with it, watch what happens. It means inwardly foul or rotten, poisoned, inner malice, morally rotten character. It means passion built on strong feelings or urges, which are negative or positive, depending on whether the desire is inspired by God or Satan. So since this is evil desire, then of course it's inspired in the wrong sense. Number five, covetousness, which is idolatry. This hit me more than any of them, was like, wait a minute, I've never seen covetousness listed that way. Covetousness, which is idolatry. And then I realized, when I covet something, I'm questioning God's fairness in my life. If I'm looking and saying, well, you know, he got a new truck, why didn't I get one? What I'm saying is God's not fair to me. 
and that becomes I'm, I'm idolizing his truck. Does that make sense? Okay, watch. Covetousness, which is idolatry, is a phrase that means numerically more. The desire for more things, i.e. lusting for a greater number of temporal things that go beyond what God determines is eternally best, beyond his preferred will. In other words, it's the uncontrolled desire to acquire. And we're getting ready to enter into a season when we already have Christmas trees up all over the place and, and, and you know, all that business. And, and, and it's all about what you get me and how much you're buying and, and all of this, right? And we got some grandpas telling their grandmas not to buy all these big presents, you know. <laughs> we'll leave that one alone, won't we? Amen. But what we've done is we've, we've fed the spirit of coveting. By the way, did you know there's an antidote for coveting? It's called contentment. Okay? And contentment, by the way, is a learned behavior. We can't get out of the oil and, 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 and anoint you or, or give you an a, you know, anointed rag to take home or whatever and pray for you and you know, receive the spirit of contentment. It don't work that way. It's a learned behavior. Watch what Philippians 4, 11 through 13 says. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned. He says it twice. I have learned the secret. Well, what's the secret? You're about to find out. The secret of living in every situation, whether it is a full stomach or empty with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, we've quoted Philippians 4.13 often alone. I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. Woohoo! You know? And that's good. But the literal context is Paul saying, I've learned the secret of contentment, and it's being like Christ, doing things through Christ. He's also saying it's not on my own strength, because on my own strength, I'm flesh, I'm man, therefore I would revert to those sinful ways. Thus, I need Christ to help me to be content. Amen. <coughs> we need to learn how to admire without having to acquire. I, I can say to you, hey, I'm glad you got a new car or a, or a new thing and not feel like I got to go home and get a new one. Does that make sense? You know, there is, there is two ways. You can either get more or want less. Well, amen. Okay. You know this, the way the ESV reads it? Coveting, which is idolatry. As, as you all know, I love digging in and studying the words, and, and I think some of you are going to like this. The phrase, which is, is derived from the same Greek verb used to identify Jesus Christ as the I am. It's the same Greek verb that over and over Jesus would use when he would say, I am the bread of life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the resurrection. In other words, when you add that Greek word to covetousness and idolatry, here's what you get. When you add it to the end of that phrase, you're saying, I'm replacing the eternal I am with temporal things. That's why it's covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, there is a positive side to coveting. There's at least two verses that talk about coveting. And one says, covet earnestly the best gifts in the New Testament. And David said, uh, uh, there's one thing I desire, that will I seek after. It's the Hebrew word for covet. Okay, here's, the diff here's how you know whether it's uh, spiritual or evil coveting. If my coveting is just to acquire to get more because I want to fuel my pride or whatever, it's wrong. But if my coveting is to benefit the kingdom of God, i.e., earnestly the best gifts, that ain't for my own personal use. That's to benefit the kingdom. If I'm coveting to be in the house of God, then that's a pure desire. So there is a positive slant to that. So long as it doesn't turn into idolatry. Make sense? Okay. <clears throat> By the way, there's a lot more we got to put to death. He goes on to say, put to death or put off anger. This means to team or swelling up to oppose, to put off wrath. This means rage, rushing along, getting heated up, breathing violently. Put off 
malice. This is a wicked disposition, the underlying principle of evil, the inherent evil which is present even if not outwardly expressed. So it can even be an inward evil that you're having, an evil uh, thought. Slander. This is abusive or scurrilous language. Blasphemy. Literally, slow or sluggish to call something good that is bad or slow to call something that's truly, or excuse me, slow to call something that is good that really is good or slow or sluggish to identify what is bad which really is evil. Watch. It's making or spreading the scandalous claims about someone with the intention of damaging their reputation. It's gossip. Number 10, obscene talk. This is filthy speech, foul language, and abusive language. And then lying. Literally, of course, to uh, willfully misrepresent or mislead to falsify. Now, again, I remind you, we're to put every one of those to death. Let me say this. If I'm dressed modestly, which is a part of what holiness is about, but I'm not practicing this, I'm not holy. Equally, if I don't practice any of these, meaning I've put them all to death, but I'm not dressed modestly, then I'm equally unholy. It's not either or, it's both and. It's inward and outward holiness, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Holiness is about putting things to death in my life that should not be there. It's also about putting on right things as well. Remember, holiness is a separation from something and unto something. It's from the world and unto God. So let's talk about putting on the new self. Colossians 3, 10 through 13. Okay, these next uh, few verses deal with what we're to put on. So here we go. We're to put on compassionate hearts. Literally, this means the deep feeling about someone's difficulty or misfortune. The capacity to feel deep emotions, such as sympathy, empathy, etc. It's gut-level compassion. It's more than just saying, hey, I'm going to pray about that. By the way, you're going to get a hamburger tonight? No, it's not being nonchalant. It's genuinely saying, brother, sister, I'm feeling that burden, and how can I pray with you? And, 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 and praying, God, help me to shoulder this burden with them so they don't carry it alone compassionate hearts. Kindness. This means meeting real needs in God's way, in God's timing. It's the spirit-produced goodness which meets the needs and avoids human harshness and cruelty. It's actually one of the nine fruit of the spirit. Humility means the lowliness of mind. These are all things we're to put on. Let me uh, also take you, let's go to James chapter 4 verses 1 through 7. I want to use this to describe humility a little bit. Ready? James 4, 1 through 7. James asked this question. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose there's no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, the humility, right? Then he says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If I'm proud, that's an attribute of Satan. But if I'm submitted and humble, that's an attribute of God, and Satan has to flee. So humility, lowliness of mind. <coughs> Number four is meekness. This is something else we've got to put on. Meekness is gentle strength, expressing the power with reserve and gentleness, a divine balanced virtue that can only operate through faith. By the way, meekness is not weakness. Rather, it's God's strength manifested through the life of a born-again believer. <clears throat> the next is patience. He says to add patience or put on patience. It's waiting sufficient time before expressing anger. It avoids the premature use of force, which is retribution, that rises out of improper anger <clears throat> and a personal reaction. Now, the Greek word here embraces steadfastness 
and staying power. If, if in the English we were to have an adjective for long-tempered as a counterpart to short-tempered, then this Greek word could be called the quality of being long-tempered, which is a quality of God. How many of you know God is still merciful with you? Isn't it strange how unmerciful we are with others, though? Fool me once, right? You've heard the phrase. Oh, she did to me once. There you go. Second time around, uh uh-uh. I love them, but I don't trust them. I forgave, but I ain't forgetting. Well, imagine if God did that. All right, this is about the 17th time you've repented for that, so, ha! Not! Can you imagine? But you know what's cool about the mercy of God? It's inexhaustible. It is? Yeah. His mercies are new every morning. You get to 11.59 today, and if possible, that you've, you've reached the last nerve, the final straw of God, and at 12 o'clock, bam, they're all brand new again. I'm not suggesting that we sin so that grace abounds. Like Paul, God forbid. What I'm telling you is this. God is so merciful to us, so patient with us, we should be with others also. Remember a time, I've told you many times, I've, I've practiced impatience. So let me reveal to you a time I've practiced patience. All right, is that all right? I've worked before in the waiting, waitress, waiter type field in, in a few jobs I've had. And so I know the pressure that can be. Well, we take, my family and I take another minister and his wife and family to dinner after service. And there in Caribou, there was only really a few places you could eat. And one of them was the Greenhouse Restaurant. Nice place. We took them out to eat there. And um, we all decided to order that day the turkey special and we all wanted mashed potatoes with it um, and so we ordered and and before they brought the order she'd walk by and you know we'd be slurping the the last little bit of the drink and <sighs> she, can i want some more drink yeah, yes please and i you know and spill it and it's like okay and my wife keeps you know nudging me under the table and i'm just you know, thank you you know <laughs> then she brings our plates Now, remember, we ordered the turkey special with mashed potatoes, but instead of mashed potatoes, it's curly fries or or waffle fries or something. I'm like, ma'am, we ordered uh, mashed potatoes. She goes, we're out. I'm like, waffle fries are fine. We're good. It just kept going. Finally, got to the end. She comes over and hands me the check. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you. I may have looked at all of three seconds. You want a calculator? I had had enough. I looked up and said, you want a tip? (laughs) She walked off. I felt a little rebuked inside, but I thought, hey, you know, at least I didn't yell. Right? So I go to the hostess. I said, ma'am, I'm not for sure who the manager on duty is. She goes, well, it's actually me. I said, well, I want to do something today. I said, I don't feel right about not leaving a tip. I said, I got to be honest, the service was poor. And the waitress is undeserving of it. But... I'm in the business of second chances, so I'm going to give you the tip. And as her manager, I'd like you to talk to her. I don't know if she's having a bad day. I don't know if she's having a divorce. I don't know what's going on, but something ain't right. And I would just hate for another customer to, you know, be offended this way. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever. About a week or about a month later, uh, the, the men of the church were having a prayer meeting, and we decided we'd have a prayer breakfast. So we went to breakfast at the greenhouse. We walk in, we get our table, and lo and behold, she's our waitress again. She comes over, and as she starts looking down the table, she gets to me, and when she does, she started crying. And she thanked me for that day and thanked me for being one to give a second chance. And I was so thankful to be able to tell her, well, you know what? I pastor a a church, and I serve a God who is in the business of second chances. That's what this patience is all about. It's that enduring. It's not going right to anger, but it's saying, let's back up a little bit and see. Maybe they've had a bad day. As it turned out, she had had a bad experience with her spouse, and it was affecting her work. 
All right. Here's something else we got to put on. Bearing with one another. I like this word bearing because it also means to carry. You ever felt like you had to carry somebody? Now, if your husband or wife are here, don't nudge them. But maybe you have had to carry them. By the way, marriage is not 50-50. It's 100-100. Sometimes it's 150-50 because one of them's sick and you've got to carry the load. If you're a parent, you know that there's times you've got to carry a load. If you're an employee, there's probably been times where your fellow employee has not carried their share of the load and you've had to do more. So bearing here does mean to carry or to uh, embrace that load. It also means to complete a process. It means bearing up even after going through the needed course of action, living out the faith that God works in, and holding up and bearing with each other. We're to add this on. These are things we're to put on. We've put to death these other things, but these are things that we're bringing to life in our lives. And then another one, number seven, and the final one we're going to look at is to forgive each other. It literally means to extend favor or grace. To freely give favor, granting forgiveness, which is pardon, and willingly bestowing favor that cancels out the wrong. Freely done, but not on the merit of the one receiving forgiveness, but rather on the merit of you being Christ-like. That's what that means, forgiving one another. As, notice, notice the text, as he has forgiven you. Verse 13, as the Lord has forgiven you. That's how you forgive, in the same manner of. And yet with all these things we're to put on, I get to my title. I've preached all that to get to my title. Notice verse 14. And above all these, put on love. Everybody say love. It's agape here. That means unconditional love. That means love without expecting anything in return. Let me say this boldly. Love compels me to act right. Love compels me to think right. Love compels me to live right. Love compels me to dress right. Because of God's perfect love manifested in me and through me, I love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I love his word. I love his church. I want his love to manifest in me and through me. I'm governed by God's love. Because I am his and he is mine, I will be holy because he is holy. The two main things that I see in scripture that that identify God of what he is. One says he is, he said, I am holy, be ye holy for I am holy. And he says, God is love. He doesn't have love, he is love. He doesn't have holiness. He is holiness. And we are to be like him. Amen? In fact, if you were to look at the listing of the nine fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians, in the the original Greek, you would find that it also suggests that love is, is a singular fruit and that the other eight are just characteristics of love. I kind of look at it like this. Imagine love being the axle. And the other eight attributes being, you know, the eight spokes that make up that wheel. Love is what turns and, right? It's that, it's that, that drive that, okay, it's unconditional love. We are to love as he is. We are to grow up in Christ. We are to measure up to the fullness and stature of him. And when we do, when we love as he does, when we above all to put on love, watch what happens. We forgive those who betray us. Loving them and hoping they'll repent. We forgive those who deny us. We forgive those who doubt us. We love those who persecute us and say all manner of evil against us. We pray for and love even our enemies. And when God's love, and notice in the rest of that chapter, he talks about the peace ruling in your hearts. When God's love and peace reign and rule in our lives, it unites all the attributes of God and all the characteristics of Christ in us and through us, producing a beautiful harmony and providing and producing spiritual maturity. I don't know about you, but I want to grow. I want to be able to get to this end of this year and say, I've seen some growth. And, and as I go into next year, be able to say, there's growth. 
I don't ever want to reach a place where, ta-da, I've reached the pinnacle. I don't have to grow no more. I've learned the Bible front, back, upside down, backwards. No, sir. No, ma'am. No. I want to grow and learn and become every day like him. Amen. Imagine the love of God. I want you to go with me to, <coughs> if you would, 1 Corinthians 13. <coughs> I want you to think about the audacity of God's love. The Bible tells us he loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. 1 Corinthians 13. <coughs> Back when I was growing up, they had a show called The Love Boat. Well, we have the love chapter here. Amen. Well, this one's better anyway. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 13. If I could speak all the language, and I'm reading New Living again, by the way. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body so I could boast about it, but I, if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith, it is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now, our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when full understanding comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly as in a cloudy mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But when then, I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. These 13 verses explaining what love is, what it does, and how great it is. But I just want to focus on four, uh, verses 4 through 7 for a minute. Love is patient and kind. Are you patient and kind? Do you really love your spouse, your family, your friends? Hmm. Are you dealing with someone who's difficult to deal with? Remember, love is patient and kind. How would Jesus deal with them? How does he want you to deal with them? Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. This is verses 4 and 5. These four characteristics are anti-love, jealousy, bitterness, pride, and being rude. Do these have any residence in your heart? If so, you need to serve an eviction notice on them tonight. Verse 5 also says it does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. This verse says a mouthful because love is undemanding. It does not get irritable. And notice the last part. It doesn't keep a record of being wronged. Yeah, well, four years ago you did this. Buddy boy, I'm going to mark it down. It doesn't do that. Does God's love dwell within you? It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Our world is filled with injustices. But love rejoices over truth, not injustice. In fact, love helps to aid in the discovery of truth. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every cir circumstance. Verse 7, it's beautiful. It's multifaceted. And an entire chapter of 13 verses describes it. Do you give up on those and lose faith in some? Love doesn't. Are you always hopeful? Love is. Do you endure through every circumstance? Love does. Are you filled with love? I want to read verses 4 through 7 again, but I'm going to this time where it says love, I'm going to put my name in there, and where it says it in referring to love, I'm going to put my name, okay, or he. So I want you to as I'm reading it, to put your name there. Ready? Myron 
is patient and kind. Myron is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. He does not demand his own way. He is not irritable, and he keeps no record of being wrong. He does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Myron never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and, and endures through every circumstance. Now, I know when we read through that, some of you probably were thinking, well, I got that one, that one, that one, but not that one and that one. It's not 75% and we get a passing grade. It's not, well, I got 80% or not. I need to do all of those. And, and, and the ones that I read that I'm like, E, well, I have been irritable sometimes. It, who said amen? Oh, I was like, I'm about to change my message right now. <laughs> Yea, and verily, submit thyself, woman. Woo! My Lord. Man, I felt it brew. It was like fire in my bones. <laughs> oh, I'm just teasing. But you're right. Think about this for a second. If, if I can't look at that and read that and mean it, I need to go to the altar and say, God, help me to produce this quality in you. Again, folks, I'm not trying to be uh, 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 awkward. And, and I prayed about this month about holiness, and I didn't want to just bring to you some of the same old, same old stuff that we always hear about. I wanted to bring you some things that reveal what holiness is really all about. I need to love like Jesus loved. I have seen, I'll never forget, we, we lived uh, in, in Maine, and we would go to the mall, and there was this one group of people that was there, and, and, and from the outward, you could tell a mile away that they were, they were one God apostolic, but when you'd get up close, every one of them had a frown on their face, and I remember one day we were at the mall, and I looked at my wife, and I said, honey, if I was a sinner, I wouldn't want to follow that anywhere it was going, you know, I love the Lord. You know, man, be happy living for Jesus. Now, on the flip side, I've seen some people that, you know, they, they, they have all this, this love for God and all this, but, yeah, you know, they need to put some clothes on. Okay? Again, it's not either or, it's both and. There's two banners in the Bible, two. A banner is a standard. Um, and when we think of the word standard, we think of, you know, do's, don'ts. I'm not saying, I'm saying a standard like it identifies, okay? Uh, if our uh, United States military uh, goes to war with Korea, for example, they will carry a flag, the United States flag. That, that's a standard. It's a banner that says this is who we are. It's on their, uh, 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 you know, jumpsuit if they're in the Air Force or whatever. There's a patch somewhere that has a Brother Everett's come in. You could see back there, you know, uh, uh, his company is there. That, that identifies. Does that make sense? So a standard. There's two of them in the Bible. You ready? Love and truth. And, and I love how the New Testament merges the two together. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and says, speak the truth in love. It's not either or. It's both and. I have known people that have a whole lot of love, but they lack truth. I've known people that, that they've got the fullness of truth, but they don't have love. It's not either or. It's both and. And above all else, love. We're to worship God in spirit. That's lowercase s. And in truth. That's spirit can be related to love, passion. Amen? Why? Do I abstain from certain things? Because I love God. Please do me a favor. If anybody asks you why you do something, please don't say, Oh, my pastor says so. If that's your answer, come talk to me and I'll help you find a better answer. You know what my answer is? Because I love God. Why don't you do this? Because I love God. I don't have to. I want to. I get to. He loved me. I get to love him. Why do I act and behave the way I do? Because he loves me. And I love him. Why do I forgive others even when they hurt me deeply? Because I love him and I love his word and because of love. Because Jesus loves me and I love him, I'll allow that perfect love to manifest through my life. How many of you remember that old song, I Want to Live? 
the way he wants me to live? Would it be all right? Can you whip that up real fast? Sister Betty, can you help me? My voice is cracking, and you want to get a couple of singers up here? Amen, that know that song. <laughs> you remember that one, Pastor Jack, Sister Chris? The song just expresses the heart of what I've preached tonight. It expresses the heart of what it means to be holy. I want to live the way He wants me to live. I'm living my life for an audience of one. Let me say it this way and then we're going to sing. If it pleases God, does it matter who it doesn't please? Equally, if it displeases God, does it matter who it pleases? Let's stand together. Are we ready? Sing lead. i 
prophesied as long as there is love we will stay sing now you're my brother in my life, through my life, to others. Hallelujah. There's ten commandments, right? Moses came down with ten tablets of stone. Or, or ten, uh, two tablets, ten uh, five on each tablet, basically. Right? Watch. The first, deal with your relationship with God. Second, deal with your relationship with each other. Which is why Jesus said, first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And the second is like to it, love your neighbor as yourself. Above all else, love. Together we will work until he comes. There's no foe that can beat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. One more time. You're my brother. 